Thank, thank you, Bill. I, I was worried about the scheduling of this conversation in the afternoon. But I have to say, as an old vaudevillian I learned a long time ago, never follow kids, dogs, or vibrators. It's just, it's, it's never gonna work. So what we decided to do, and I'm gonna ask the panelists to come up here in a moment, what we've decided to do is change the topic. Based on the morning conversation and the afternoon conversation, we're gonna talk about transparent sex. Okay, does that work for everybody? Um, good afternoon. The results are in, and I will tell you, no media agency won an Emmy this year, or last year, or any year actually. But still, the premise of today's conversation, that media investment agencies develop some of the best content ideas, may sound like a bit of a reach if you take it literally. So please don't. We're not saying that IPG media brands spitball storylines for the open, final season of The Office or that Anthony Zyker is taking script notes from Laura Desmond. Seriously, we're not contending that Jack Clue's next job is to develop a crime thril thriller starring Erwin Gottlieb. Although, he is planning to retire in a few months, and you know how nutty these ad guys can get when they have nothing to do. But we've been wrong before. Remember old James Patterson over at JWT, who always said he had a book in him. We just didn't know it was gonna be a book every week for about 15 years. I think it's 108 and counting. And of course, we're not suggesting that Bill Konigsberg is going to be the next showrunner of the next NBC hit. Hey, they may find one eventually. And Bill, if they need the help, you could hook them up with the Geico Gecko and we could have something that will work. But wait, the Geico ad characters starring their own network show? That sounds distressingly familiar. No, actually, the point we're making is that the best TV content is now frequently discovered, developed, and or backed by media shops. This is not entirely new. After all, I'm sure many of you remember 1950. Unfortunately, I do. When Procter & Gamble produced the very, <coughs> excuse me, first TV soap opera, The First Hundred Years. Unfortunately, The First Hundred Years ran for only two, but that's television. Anyway, it's a new ball game now. Media companies now partner with content creators and producers from the very birth of an idea, collaborative efforts that transcend the traditional sponsor storytelling dynamic. Visionary executives at media shops were the first to embrace the full potential of branded content. And many hit shows might never have come to air without the support of brands and their media agencies as early in the script development process as possible. In fact, the Association of National Advertisers Alliance for Family Entertainment did that with shows like Gilmore Girls, Friday Night Lights, and Chuck, as well as a host of others. Moreover, now that the doors are open to content creation and the doors have effectively been blown apart by digital technology and everyone as a creator, media agencies, the organizations that kind of sort of lit the fuse on this trend in the first place, are even more central to the storytelling process. So there's no reason to believe that the next great story idea won't come out of a media shop. It's not like their leadership don't have the bona fides to do it. And, and as I said, have been a part of it from the very first and most memorable branded content plays in recent memory. I think it's safe to say there may be some content ideas bouncing around in those talented minds. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Scott Donatin, Claudia Cahill, Brent Poor, and Adam Pincus to join me on the stage. So, so not in any order, but Scott, um, properly giving you the credit for the not so distant past Madison and Vine concept, not only the concept of the, of the two industries converging, but you wrote a book about it and you created the concept. And in fairness, it was Scott's idea to talk about transparent sex, so I do want to give him credit for that. Um, but, but you coined the phrase Madison and Vine, and you know well that the one thing I said back then when you did it was, probably should have been Madison, Vine, and Valley if we thought about it, referencing how technology was going to drive the two industries together and, and make it more efficient. But, you know, now probably, I'm gonna guess 10 or 11 years after uh, Madison and Vine, I think it was 2001, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, or 2002. 2002. Actually, it was 2002. 
um, so 10 years, almost 13 years later, was the promise of Madison and Vine realized? Is it being realized? And you know, as, as now somebody who used to write about it but now actually does it, um, it I'm going to ask the same question that David Birkelin asked of the panelists this morning. Are you really happy, Scott? No. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I, I how's think, it working out? I, I, think, I think the beauty of it is exactly what, what Madison and Vine saw coming was just this basic idea that every new technology was putting the end user rather than the content creator and distributor in control of the information flow, which meant that the intrusive, interruptive form of advertising was going to become less and less effective and efficient, and that therefore brands had to find new ways to communicate that audiences would want to receive. The, the major difference, I think, is that at the time, it was very fear-driven. It was basically fear of the DVR, and, and the basic concept was, if they can skip my 30-second spot, then I'm going to hide my messaging inside the programming that they're choosing to watch, and they can't skip and make it DVR-proof. And, 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 and then there were a lot of these kind of things that happened that were really ham-handed and over the top, and there was backlash, and people thought it didn't work, and people thought it was a trend and a fad, and there was, so there was this period a few years in where I think it kind of went the other way. Um, and, and, and what's really evolved now, first of all, obviously the digital piece, it was always driven by technology, but especially what's happening, you know, once, once you could stream video and once you could do all of that, um, is that brands stopped thinking about hiding their messaging inside the content people were choosing to watch, and they began to think, I actually have stories and ways to communicate with audiences that they will choose and I can tell stories that they will choose to spend time with. And I think that's the absolute underpinning of everything about where marketing has to go right now. Everything has to be story-based marketing, including your 30-second ads. It can't be this interruptive, intrusive, I, I barge in on the conversations you're having to talk about myself. It's got to be I get invited in and I add value to the conversations you're having or else you're not going to reach anyone. So, so let, me, let me drill down on something you said, Scott, because when it did start and these conversations began, the DVR was, was the threat. And, and when we listened to the, the uh, network sales heads, David and Linda and Joanne and Jeff talk earlier, we talked about C3, C7, all of those things. I, I guess I'm throwing this as a jump ball question, but I think the fear today isn't DVR, it's stacking and binging. I mean, it's, it's how people are consuming content. Is that, and Brent and I were talking about this in the hall, so please feel free to jump in, Brent. I mean, is that the challenge? Because I'd love a show of hands how many people are finding themselves stacking and binging these days, if you're familiar with the terms. I mean, just a rough idea. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I think it's something that everyone's concerned about, but I think we continue to train consumers poorly. Um, we, you know, you introduce a, you know, whether it was, you know, uh, digital video and we had such low expectations for what it was that you would put a single 30 second spot as a lead into it. And then all of a sudden we're trying to monetize the space again. And no one wants to go to a full commercial load. People really do, they don't think of it as watching television or video on your computer. For them, it's all still just TV. And I think that we've done a bad job of training them. And then if you look at the way that they're moving across uh, to Netflix and things like that, look, your lives are becoming so complicated to begin with that you're trying to get as much content as you can in one sitting. So I think it's also why you have to be really platform agnostic. You've got to go and make sure that you're on every platform and across every screen to capture them across their consumer journey and when they're going to be really receptive to engage in something. And I mean, if you look at the numbers on consumption on, you know, on tablets and smartphones, it is really where people, you have five seconds at the, you know, you're getting your oil change, you turn to your phone or whatever you have in your hand to say, you know, entertain me. Yeah, and consumers are programming their own devices. So that is really what has created this content cloud that kind of lives above everything. And people are pulling down from that cloud and programming, you know, whether it's their iPad or their mobile device or whatever, they're, they're programming their own consumption. But, but if we talk about the, the, the you know, the um, so many devices, two things, first of all, the concept of this panel was talking about TV. I think we probably should have excluded or left the word TV out and just said video if, if, if we rethink it. Um, but, but that being said, what do you guys, and, and you know, Adam, since uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you, what do you think 
of the mediums that are available today are the best for storytelling. I mean, is it well, going to still come back to that thing on the wall that we know as television, or are there better places to tell stories? I think it's wherever the audience wants to get their programming from, but I wanted to address the binging comment for a second because you, you position it as, look, this is maybe the next thing that people will be afraid of is a new kind of audience behavior. But as Netflix just demonstrated with House of Cards, it's, it's challenge, it's also opportunity because just reading what critics had to say about that show, some of them even suggested I might not have made it through 13 episodes if, I, if it had been on every week. But I stayed through the entire show because I could get it all at once, it fit into exactly the way I wanted to consume that, and certainly, I mean, all the, there's half a dozen shows that I've watched basically in the course of a week, entire seasons, you know, and that's actually conservative. I think a lot of people do it in a weekend or a day. But, but it's interesting because last week at the uh, Deutsche Bank conference, Jeff Bukas was talking about his views of TV everywhere, and he made, he was asked the question about looking at House of Cards, 13 episodes available all at once versus, uh, Game of Thrones, you have to wait every week. Even with HBO Go, you still have to wait until it's available. And that's not the way people want to consume content today, well, at least. HBO's actually changed some of those um, rules and restrictions because they've done it with, um, with Girls and um, Enlightened this year where they'll do a, a full episode the week before. And so they're, look, they're out there trying to test the model. The bigger issue is it's only, all of these things are only a threat to you if you're trying to defend a legacy model and hang on to a legacy way of doing business. And there are some people who can't escape that because that is the business they're in. But I don't think brands should be thinking of these things as threats at all. Each one of them is an opportunity to think differently about how an audience is going to get your message. And to your point about what kind of content, it, it depends who the audience is, what the positioning is, what you're trying to communicate always, to them. Content, content could be as simple as, a social tweet. I think Oreo got more attention for Dunks in the Dark than they did for the Super Bowl spot, um, and it could be video. I mean, it could you know it's across the range of, of you know the, where they're consuming, what they're consuming, and what you're trying to it, drive. It, well, it has good to be point. formatted. It has to be formatted to the screen yep. that you're actually right. pulling the content Absolutely. in, and it, you know and look, we were you know testing things early out, and it was just we'll just port it across every screen. You know, we'll force that it, and it's really not how people engage at all. Yeah, so, so, Claudia, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you a question before you respond to that, because Scott talked about legacy models. And one of the things we chatted about in, in, in sort of preparation for this conversation was about talent. Mm -hmm. So in, in the wake of these, you know, the multiplicity of platforms and viewing habits, how has that changed the way talent deals are being made? I, I'm, I'm curious because, or, or does it at all, because sure. there was a legacy way of doing a talent deal and maybe today it's different. Well, I'm going to back up for a second and address the kind of the explosion of content that's coming at us right now, requests from our clients that they don't really fully understand all of the various types of content, how to access it what to do with it, you know, the differences. So we're finding now that we have to develop a, a real strategy for all from user-generated content to pure video to television content, experiential gaming, music, et cetera, that they need a, a really tight strategy annually to figure out how to use content and how to best reach those consumers. But with talent, we're, we're at the point now where we're working with media partners to put asks into our deals so that if we want to lift a piece of talent out of a show, which we did recently with Suburgatory mm -hmm. for Lowe's, and we had Anna Gasteyer um, functioning as her character in custom spots that we created, but that has to be put into an ask into the development document before the deal gets done. So, so let me ask you a question. Being housed within the agency groups, whether it's OMD or Ensemble at Media Brands or SMG or Mediacom as part of Group M, um, do you think you're better suited than Hollywood, in, in quotes, um, based on your, you're, you're at the hotbed of research and consumer trends and data and the like on the one hand, and I, I think it was who it's here, Shelley Zalas at OTX, who launched sort of online testing for things to get faster reads, so it wasn't after the fact as much. You know, you've got all the data at your fingertips from the, from the agencies. Are, are, you think that helps you be better content creators? Well, there's I, an interesting, interesting front page Times piece. I think we probably would all piece. have a different opinion. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I worked at Warner Brothers, and you know, there was, a, there was one, you know, 
mindset that was they wanted to see the data and then there were other people that were terrified it was going to turn television into a widget factory. No, I was just going to say there was a there was an interesting times piece last week about a lot of the over the top networks talking about Amazon and its forays into original programming and Netflix and talking about how the programmers were now going to be armed with this incredible wealth of data. And I came from the programming side. I was at a network and I think it is somehow dissonant for programmers to really think that way. It's really helpful to understand exactly how the audience is watching and whether they're dumping out you know, after 20 minutes on an hour long show and maybe you, you inform some of your choices about what you do and what you choose, but I cannot imagine that the programming executives at those places are going to behave any differently than any other programmer, which is they're going to make decisions somewhat informed by science, somewhat informed yeah. by data, and then they're going to say, we have a brand, we have an audience we need to serve that to, and they expect a certain kind of show from us. And Netflix is going to define itself through things like House of Cards and other smart choices that they're going to attempt to make, and they're going to have a lot of insight into what's working and what's not. But I don't think that it's going to become a scientific endeavor. I had to like rock an audience. But, but no, it, I'm, going to, I'm going to break the question into two parts. The first is, I, 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 do I think media agencies are best positioned to lead brands into the storytelling age? And the answer is absolutely. Yeah. We're sitting around the people who have the insights into not just the media spending, but into the business and into the business challenges and the marketing and the goals. They have deep dive insights on who the target audience is and what their behaviors are. And we can For use that to trigger. For the brands we're working with. Um, so, so that's, I, I believe that media agencies are the best position. The Hollywood question, it's, it's not a uh, who's better position. In, in fact, it's very much a collaborative yeah. effort with, with storytellers of any kind, by the way. It's not just Hollywood, it's any kind of storyteller. Look at what American Express does with the open forum. That's obviously content and that's not Hollywood content. The bigger opportunity is that brands have what I call the ability to work with the world's largest creative department. Yep. Because every storyteller in the world, Anthony Zyker wants to take notes. Anthony Zyker can sit down and you can talk to him about a brand and their target audience and he can spin brilliant stories quickly that get to the human role it plays in people's lives and how that kind of messaging will engage. Mark Burnett can sit down with one of our clients, which he did, and say, hey, if I wanted to create a show aimed at Hispanic moms, you guys know more about what's necessary, authentic, and credible in the everyday life of a Hispanic mom than I as a 58-year-old white man could ever know. So why wouldn't I use, you know, they, they want the wallet still, obviously, the Hollywood content creators, and they need to partner with people like us who can protect the interests of the brand and, and know, you know, what the brand needs to achieve it. But this is about, we, you have the, why would anybody limit the idea of creativity to 12 people sitting in a room that says this is the creative department when in fact every storyteller mind and ability to engage humans is out there wanting to work I, with brands. I totally agree. I mean, that it's the collaboration that is the, the trick behind that and really understanding how both sides of the equation think. I mean, the Madison and Vine piece, you know, was all about that and everything has not been successful. It's, it's really being able to bridge those two mentalities effectively. So I'm going to ask a question that dates back 13 years ago, Scott, when we, when we did that first panel on, on, the, on the high seas, on the marketing forum boat, and, and we talked about Hollywood Boulevard meets Madison Avenue. If I asked the question then, I'm going to ask it 13 years later, um, or so. Um, who are the right constituents around the table? The talent agencies in Hollywood still think they have a seat at the table? Production companies believe they have a seat at the table. Creative agencies are raising their hand and saying, we want to you know, choose me. Certainly the media agencies represented here. Talent. Well, we find, and I'd love to hear, but to me, the more people are around the table, the better. The harder it can be to manage sometimes. You've never I'm not gone saying to I a like... board meeting at my temple. <laughs> I'm not it's saying... definitely not the case. I'm not saying I like too many cooks, but I'm <laughs> saying that what the worst thing that happens is when um, when branded content becomes this thing that's stuck off here at the end of everything else you're doing. And that's still happening with a lot of brands. More and more, our, our clients are, as Claudia said, coming to us and to help them figure out how to much more strategic approach. But for the most part, it's been, here's our creative strategy, here's our media strategy, and then, oh yeah, we've got, a, we've got we some money left over, let's over stick this over here, side. we'll separate it from everything else, we won't surround it, we won't amplify it, then we won't be happy with the results. And it's much more about when you really do it in an integrated way. So we, we, I, I'm not, I wasn't dissing creative agencies before, obviously, they've done masterful work for brands continue to, and they are our partners on a lot of these things, and they have, when we have the creative agency in and buy in from them, and we have, 
you know, the social people in and we have the marketing team from the client in and we have the right partners on the content side is when these things have the best chance of succeeding because they're not these kind of one-off tactics, they're actually a strategic marketing platform. Instead of media execution, it's a marketing plan exactly. that you actually have to develop. Exactly. And it's, it is, there are so many different people that actually have to sit with you. And again, you know, I agree, 100% agree with you, it's, but we've also got to get the creative agencies to create more contextual advertising that fits in as well. Right. I mean, it can tend to be a little disruptive. Yeah, and it, it's the more assets that we have in this space to create longer form content and, and executions of a campaign, the, the agencies still don't think in that longer form mentality, whether it's messaging, visual assets, et cetera. It, it, that, will, that helps us dramatically create this other execution. Right. It, it is marketing, I mean, that's a really important point. We've said it, it sounds simple, but clients still come all the time and they say, we need a content strategy. And I say, no, you don't. You need to understand the role of narrative in your marketing strategy. Okay, it's an important distinction. It, 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 it's a, a critically important distinction. Dee Solomon, one of our, one of our uh, right. important uh, media linkers, wrote a piece uh, two weeks ago in Media Biz Bloggers on native advertising. And we're talking about this as being, you know, the next gen. How are you guys responding to that with your clients? Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of a lot of noise, but it, there's a lot of resonance with it in the marketplace. I mean, well, I mean, I, I agree with what Scott was saying that that I think that the biggest challenge to overcome is a, uh, a cultural one that's broad among everybody, which is this content thing lives over here, and it doesn't. It it is uh, a way of communicating that is increasingly relevant because of how much control the audience has. And I think that when you say content includes all of those things, especially as powered by, so especially as powered by social, which now I think becomes one of the critical things for us is to say, well, how much did this travel on its own? That becomes a, a, a very important criteria that we judge things by now. How much do people pick it up voluntarily? Um, we need to not have it be sort of this dangling participle at the end of the conversation and be more integral to this is how we're going to use television. It has a role to play. It's great. 30 second spot is not, uh, is, you know, is, is not a dead animal. Um, but here's how social is going to play into this. Here's how this type of long form storytelling is going to play into this. And it has to be a holistic conversation. I, I, I agree and I sort of disagree about as many people around the table the better because it is, does become a little bit opinion soup which um, is not always the road to the best creative result, and especially when there's a lot of different agendas in terms of we have to have the brand message right out front. Um, no, really, it's got to be about the audience and what they want to get into. I think as long as people can find a healthy way to collaborate, then yeah, everybody's opinion oh, yeah, is no, relevant, right. but not in all, we, in, in not in all the same ways. Yeah. We've been in the nightmare situation yeah. as well. Healthy but. collaboration. So, so l let me come back to TV. Uh -huh. First of all, and, and, and not use the word video. If we're dealing with a property, and I don't know really anymore if there's anything that even qualifies as strictly a TV property, because I think that's probably an arcane even definition, but let's just say something is a, you know, a, a unique TV property. It, as you're looking at branded content, does the old argument or discussion, not argument, between reach and engagement matter more or less? I mean. You know, in terms of measuring content, branded content, content created by whoever. Yeah, I mean, I think if you can use like what we did with X Factor and Pepsi as an example, it wasn't just about the rating of that show. I think everyone knows the rating fell off this past year. It became, and it always is, a much more comprehensive set of metrics for us, and social trending around that show was massive. So it kind of offset the fact that the ratings were inconsistent. We built up traction in another area uh, that really made a difference. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues with that you talked about native advertising before with any of these things, one of the biggest challenges I think we do face in any form of custom content creation is that it doesn't scale in the way that more traditional forms of advertising do. And th this, is a, this is an issue that marketers really do have to confront because the reason that advertising has been the forward face of marketing for 100 years is because it scales very simply with the reach and frequency and you can do that. And, and this space doesn't scale. Now, there's some degree to which it doesn't matter because this is what you have to do. This is what marketing is becoming in various ways. 
Um, and I even, I hate the phrase branded content, I hate the phrase content, I hate the, I hate the, I hate the phrase yeah. native advertising, we need, we need new language. Um, but I read recently somebody had said, I forgot who the quote or I'd attribute it, but it wasn't me, but it's only branded content if it's bad, otherwise it's just content. <laughs> and, and, you know, but this issue of the scalability, I think is a bigger issue. Uh, the currency and ratings and numbers, those things are always, they're important as a kind of beginning thing. People like to see them, but they're not, they're not the measure of whether or not something worked anymore. Well, I think it also depends on your targeting and your consumer. It's like, can you do a hyper-targeted piece? And is it the right, is it the right consumer that you're reaching? And I think, right. you know, now with the technology, you know how to really get that deep. It's really about finding the right audience, not just everybody. So, so in terms of finding the right audience, so let's turn the clock back to last April. Lots of noise around the digital, up, you know, new fronts and, and, and uh, whatnot, and it's going to happen again, and this time in a more organized, uh, I'd say, fashion in terms of the AI IAB stepping in and making it more of a process and a market. Mm -hmm. We've had lots of discussions about the success and or lack thereof, I wouldn't use the word failure, but lack thereof, in terms of the launch of all the premium channels that YouTube took such an important leadership role with. So I, I don't, again, I don't look at it as success or failure. I think, I think it was a success in terms of mining new territory in a meaningful way. But before you answer, Brett, I want to ask the question. Um, it's usually helpful that way. I don't, I don't know, call me, call me crazy, but. Um, Ready to go. You know, one of the discussions we've had back and forth is on good old fashioned promotion. Okay, and if I take Scott's point, which I agree, it's only branded content if it's bad, but so content in general. Is it safe to say we're all just gonna rely on the algorithm to drive viewership, or is there still a place in the world for good old fashioned Barnum and Bailey marketing? You know, wrap a bus occasionally, take a billboard, do something to promote content. What's, where do you guys come out on that in terms Look, of? Look, I mean, I ran a branded, I ran a, you know, a, a series team over at Warner Brothers, and we did, the WB.com in 2008, and we were really early. And one, fa one thing that we continually found is that we were buying our audience. Every episode was a bought audience. You had to promote it, you had to get people there, and you had to, you know, and I think our biggest struggle was, are they actually viewing like television or are they binging? You, you know, trying to figure out the patterns is really what part of the hardest part of it. But you totally have to promote it like it is, again, a very familiar model that you're aware of. And if you even go back to Netflix with House of Cards, they promoted it like it was a television show. Well, and wasn't that part of the, the, the situation with all of these custom channels on YouTube that was the promotion there? I mean, I, I would ask these guys that question. I, I think there were plans to have a campaign to try to change behavior of how people viewed content on YouTube. And but they're, never... not, they're not set up even on their homepage right. to be able to get people yeah, there. I mean, and, and, and they know again, that, and that's changing. The, but I think the, the view, bigger issue... The view there was algorithmic, you know... An, an algorithm is not an idea. You, you can use the algorithm to get some insights that can help drive creativity. It can't replace creativity. So I, I think that's a really important distinction. And, and YouTube has learned a lot in the past year about how people consume what they consume, what works, what doesn't, which audiences are consuming. They, and they can use all of that to, you know, and, and distribution strategies, by the way, and well thought out distribution plans behind any of these things are extremely important because a lot of people still do create content with no thought to the distribution strategy until very late in the process, if at all. And then again, they set themselves up to, to not fail. Not our companies. We don't do that. Not, not, <laughs> not any of our never, companies, no. Never have. But I'm, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna, you, you made another point, which I've lost, so let's just move on. So, so it, let, then let me make another point that hopefully won't be lost on you. Um, I wanna talk about that horrible part of everyone's life when they're in the midst of pitches, okay? Because we are speaking to uh, the four A's here, and agency folks get to pitch all the time lately. It seems like it's a daily, a part of your daily bread. Um, there was a time when the content players at the media agencies were like the media buyers of old. You'd be invited to show up at a new business presentation, you'd get three minutes at the end and they'd say thank you. And because you were a shiny new object that everyone needed to have. Has that changed? I mean, you're all in that position. You're all part of large enterprises who are constantly in the, in the pitch mode with new yeah. clients. Do you I mean, get a I real seat at the table, a real voice in the, in the new business pitch process? 
Yeah, I think it has changed. At least where we are, I think that storytelling has become something that's so important to the overall pitch process. And since we specialize, if there's a specialty within there, that's storytelling, I think that we're invited in very early into that process. And that I think that there's a consideration that the, the standards of the industry, the whatever you want to call it, the blocking and tackling, are still really important. And you have to do those well. And you have to prove that you can do them well. You have to have ideas. You need to be able to communicate those ideas. They have to be the right kinds of ideas. I mean, what I always hesitate is how much emphasis are we putting on the specific idea versus our ability to come up with good ideas that seem strategic, that will reach an audience, that seem like they're creative and original in some way and can be effective, uh, as opposed to getting hung up on, I hate that talent. Yeah, and You're for out. us, it's, it's really, you know, it's still evolving, but the fact that we exist to maximize our clients' media investment that we can get all of these content, whether it's production, talent, distribution, et cetera, out of media conversation is a pretty simple premise. I mean, that's why we exist within the company. So yes, it's evolving. I think there's much more of a demand right after the first of this year from clients that want content. They don't know how to get it or what to do with it yet, but. But they want it. Yeah. I think there are, I think there are a lot of expectations with clients that what we do is in media is going to be incredibly creative. And their expectations have changed in the course of the past 10 years that I've been in this business. It is a very different pitch than 10 years ago. And ideas yeah. are at the heart of how we actually create experiences and can show that we can connect with consumers. I was going to say, it's, it's inseparable for us. I mean, when, when we're pitching new business, we are just part of the team, and the idea that everybody on the team is coming up with and then how it's going to be brought to life is part of one integrated way of thinking and approaching the, the problem. So it's, but oh, the other thing is that every single RFP that comes in now wants to know what, do you, what are your capabilities and point of view on content, and, mm -hmm. and you know, how do we do that? So every, every single brand is asking for it but we no longer separate it out as a separate conversation. It's inseparable from everything else you're doing. So, so let me ask the, 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 the question regarding the elephant in the middle of the room here, the measurement. So we were fortunate enough to work with the industry with the 84As and the ANA and the IAB on the three Ms on the Make a Measurement Make Sense project. And Jeff Lucas sat up here before and said if he could make anything go away, it would be OCR, which I don't agree with, but I just want to be on record. Um, I like Jeff, I just thought he was wrong. Um, the, the, question is, is content subject to the same measurement and shouldn't everybody want to create something regardless of whose it is that's going to measure across platforms so that the advertisers can have that metric that they need? So it's two questions. Is content being subject to the same metrics as anything, A, and B, is there anything you th think exists at this point where you can get that measurement, where we can have one metric across platforms, which is the holy grail, obviously. I think the biggest problem 10 years ago with the space was the lack of measurement, and it kept it from scaling as a business more quickly and being taken seriously. Um, and I think the biggest myth right now is people who still try and say that it's not measurable because it's completely measurable. And you have to, it, it's a question again of what are you trying to measure and, and what do you want, what is the brand trying to achieve? And do you have, you know, if you set up in advance, here's what we want to do, then obviously you can measure it on the back end. More importantly, Every single study that we've done, and we work very closely with, with UM and, and initiative on this and, and BPN within media brands, every measure we have and every study shows that custom content as part of the mix amplifies yes. by as much as seven times the impact of, of straight media spend. So I, I've never seen anything that, that says that it doesn't do anything other than add value. So if you run an integration in a show followed by a custom spot, followed by a brand spot, that kind of exponential increase across the board, it's, it's recall, it's perception, it's all of those measures. It's every brand's looking for different KPIs. You know what, every business has their own ask. It is, you know, it's incredibly hard to get the entire industry to agree on something that is a standardization. But, you know, I mean, I think every brand comes to the table and they know what they want to have measured. And some people, if they have good streams of data, can actually tell you what the sales impact is. So as we, look at the, as we look at the marketplace in OTT and over the top, and, and, and we talk about the cord cutters and the cord shavers and the never haves, obviously going to have, and we don't have enough time to have that conversation, although it would be a good topic for another conversation with a large carafe of red wine in front of us, just <laughs> to understand where it's all going. But um, it, it, as we look at that, I'm taking the word cord cutters and I'm gonna use that 
terrible word, bundling or unbundling, are we about to see, since storytelling is at the heart of what you're doing, arguably the creative agencies would always say storytelling was always at the heart of what they're doing. Are we seeing, and I don't want Erwin to shoot me from the audience, but are we seeing a new bundle? Are we seeing a new bundle, and are the media agencies the link to rebundle in some fashion or create a new bundle? Whoa. I think we're Whoa. different. I think we're a very different mix. And, you know, I, I think if you look at it, it, first of all, what is the life stage of your brand? Have you proven superiority? And once you've proven superiority, it really is about making that emotional connection because it's going to be the only way that you can actually get marketplace growth. And so I think for us, it's a mix. I don't think it's, it is how does this all work in your communication and your marketing plan? I mean, I think for us, it's media-led. I mean, because of the way that we work and how we leverage the overall investment, the media piece of it is critical. I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. I don't want to leave <laughs> one guy up here. You, you know, asking. Adam, what, what I love is just answer whatever question you'd like in that case. <laughs> well, if we're talking about rebundling in terms of a new bundle, I would never bundle. say rebundling. A new, a new bundle shot. in terms of bringing a like-minded audience together, then yeah, I think that we can play a really important role in that. Because I think if we can identify where they are and how they live and how they consume media, regardless of what channel it's on or what device it's on, then absolutely we can bring that audience together around content that's meaningful to them. On that note, I think we may be the first one that ends on time. So. What I'd like to do is say thank you guys thank and, you. and appreciate your time and your interest and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.